So while doom scrolling through Twitter, I kept coming across the free Britney hashtag. If you didn't know already, Britney Spears, now 38 and still one of the biggest names in entertainment today, has been under the conservatorship of her father since her mental breakdown in 2008. Conservatorship is primarily for adults who can't make decisions for themselves, such as people with mental illnesses like dementia. However, it's clear that Britney can make decisions for herself, and she's even gone online saying that she's fine and posts her own videos. She does this firstly to quench the rumors that her father is keeping her captive, and secondly, to prove to the public that she's fine and that she's ready to take control of her finances and her medical care. Recently, her father stepped down as conservator for health reasons, and at the request of Brittany, the Best Number Trust has been put in place as her co-conservator, meaning that her father could be ousted soon if the judge rules in her favor next time they go to court. Her mother has said that she wants to be co-conservator and has also said that her father shouldn't be the conservator. Britney's mom is seen as kind of like a wishy-washy figure in this story because she's seen as both this like terrible stage mom and also this god-fearing woman who capitalized off of her daughter's mental breakdown in 2008 by writing a tell-all book. Either way, it seems to me that Britney doesn't have a good relationship with either of her parents. So as someone who's fascinated by the early days of the entertainment industry and also the entertainment industry as a whole, I thought I'd make a video about Free Britney and how that speaks to a larger pattern at play. And that is child abuse and patriarchal control in the entertainment industry. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name's Cheyenne and I'm an Asian American adoptee and expat living in Brazil. I post new videos about race, feminism, and pop culture every Tuesday and Friday, so if you're into that, please subscribe and ring the bell. So part one, Hollywood's history with child abuse. It should be no surprise to you that Hollywood has a long history of exploiting and abusing its child stars. And the parents, of course, are also complicit, or at least feign blissful ignorance, in the abuse of their children. Since the early days of Hollywood, thousands of children have come in and out, and only a few have stayed around long enough to become household names. However, the first actress I'm going to talk about never became a household name. And that is Virginia Davis, who played Alice in Walt Disney's Alice comedies when she was only five years old. In Neil Gabler's Disney biography, he describes Virginia's mother as thirsty for fame. Even before the Davises moved to California to continue to work with Walt, Virginia's mother and Virginia herself already went to Hollywood to try to get Virginia's foot in the door. But as Gabler writes, there were just too many mothers and daughters in the rat race for them to stand a chance. Virginia Davis would later be replaced in the Alice comedies in the mid-1920s due to pay cuts, and unfortunately, Virginia would retire in the early 1940s without being credited in any other major role. I think it's important that we start here before we get into the bigger child stars because most children being brought to Hollywood by their parents don't make it. There are only a certain number of spots and so many children, and most of them get rejected and never achieve their parents or their own dreams of fame. Fame is a lottery that very few people win, and it's important that we talk about the reality of it because some people just won't make it no matter how much they work or how talented they are. So moving on from the 1920s and into the 1930s, we get one of the biggest child stars to date, so big in fact that she named her autobiography Child Star, and that is Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple began acting at age three in the Baby Burlesque series, and yes, it is as disturbing as it sounds. Baby Burlesque starred children in adult roles in order to satirize the contemporary happenings of the day. In one short, Temple played a sex worker named Charmaine. Temple would later describe the series as a cynical exploitation of our childhood innocence. Not only was the series as a whole exploitative, when the kids acted up, as kids do, they were forced into a windowless soundstage and forced to sit on a block of ice. Temple said that sitting on the ice didn't have a profound effect on her. Far as I can tell, the black box did no lasting damage to my psyche. Its lesson of life, however, was profound and unforgettable. Time is money. Wasted time means wasted money means trouble. In one article I read while researching the topic entitled Shirley Temple, the Child Star Who Wasn't a Cautionary Tale from The Independent, the author glamorizes Temple and her patience and calmness in the face of adversity. However, I personally don't like this idea of exceptionalism 
or think that child stars should take everything with grace because it pits the way they act against one another. Like, why can't Britney just handle the abuse and psychological battles like Temple did? Temple does seem to handle everything very appropriately and maturely, but maybe she can only do that because she ended up marrying rich, inherited millions from her own career, and was able to forge a new career path for herself in politics, which not many women in the entertainment industry can do. Anyway, after the Baby Burlesque series was over, Temple went on to star in over four dozen films until she reached age 12. The films usually centered on Temple bringing a couple together or displayed some rags to riches story. They weren't very deep, but they had entertaining songs and dance numbers that seemed to be needed during the Great Depression. Temple also was in the first on-screen interracial dance in her film entitled The Little Colonel, where she tap danced with black entertainment legend Bill Bojangles Robinson in 1935. Robinson was the first in many roles he took on, but he's primarily remembered for his complex and intricate stair dance. In The Little Colonel, he's able to show off his dance moves, but he still plays a servant with a horribly stereotypical accent. And though he was the highest paid black entertainer at the time, making more than $2 million in his lifetime, he died poor and his funeral had to be arranged by Ed Sullivan, his longtime friend. Going back to Temple, it's important to note that she and her movies saved Fox Studio and that she was also compensated well for it. Her money was put in a trust fund and she received the millions that she made over the years when she was 21 and retired. However, her father ended up stealing around $89,000 from it, but she didn't seem to have any hard feelings about that. Besides her father stealing some of her fortune, Temple was also a target for sexual predators. One in particular was a film critic who wrote extremely provocative and inappropriate reviews about her and was later sued for libel successfully by Temple's parents when she was only eight years old. Anyway, once Temple turned 12, it seemed as though her life as a child star was up. She ended up leaving Fox and going to MGM, who said that they were going to produce movies for her that were more age appropriate. In a meeting with MGM producer Arthur Freed, she was sexually assaulted as he exposed himself to her. She laughed nervously and he kicked her out, but the contract was already signed and she made a few movies, but none of them garnered critical acclaim. At age 17, David O. Selznick, who produced Gone with the Wind, tried to rape her and even had this contraption that would lock people in his office so he could force himself onto them. During this time, she also got married to her first husband, who was an abusive drunk, and later divorced him and then remarried at age 21 to one of the richest men in California at the time, Charles Alden Black. Afterwards, she decided to retire and pursue politics in support of the Republican Party. Temple had an extremely turbulent life. Even before she was born, her mother hoped that she was going to be a musical prodigy and even played music to her when she was in the womb. And her wish came true. Temple was kind of an entertainment prodigy as she had a photographic memory and could memorize scripts and also had a great sense of rhythm. She even seemed to handle the oppressive environment of working with sexual predators and horrible rumors that she was actually a 30-year-old woman and that her hair was fake with grace and maturity. In the end, she did come out of child stardom seemingly unscathed and even helped destigmatize talking about breast cancer as she herself became a survivor in 1973. But just because she seemed to get a happy ending doesn't mean that all child stars do, and also doesn't mean that she herself was kind of forced out of the industry. Not only did people think that she was no longer worth investing in when she was only in her early teens, but they also suggested that she should change her name, and that was a common practice back then, but with Shirley Temple it kind of hits a bit differently. In the end, they just didn't think that she was worth the time and effort and that should just go to show you how Hollywood just likes to milk a cow until it runs dry and then move on to the next big thing. And that kind of system is just inherently abusive to the people who work there. They were moving on without her. To them, child stars were disposable, a dime a dozen. And I'm glad in the end that it worked out for her, but for so many others, it doesn't. After Temple left the film industry, new stars were brought in. These were glamorous young Hollywood stars that would only get bigger as they became adults. Ava Gardner, Lana Turner, and Elizabeth Taylor all cropped up during this time. 
But there was one exception, one ugly duckling or little hunchback as she was referred to on the sets of MGM, and that is of course the one and only Judy Garland. Judy started her entertainment career young, as her parents were vaudevillians. Her mother and sisters would perform together during the 1920s and through the mid-1930s. Judy, being the youngest, had the most life left in her as a star, and she also had an extremely adult and mature-sounding voice. And hearing this voice come out of such a young girl was awe-inspiring to casting agents. She was signed to MGM when she was only 13 in 1935, and then later in 1939, she would star in The Wizard of Oz as Dorothy Gale, and it was a roller coaster from there. She was one of the biggest stars of the 1940s, but she also has one of the most tragic stories. Due to her not looking like the glamorous star of the day, Judy was constantly put on restrictive diets. Not only that, but she was worked to death. The studios at the time did not adhere to child labor laws, and all they really wanted to do was squeeze out as much money as they could from their young stars. Due to the harsh working conditions, she was given amphetamines to keep her awake and barbiturates to put her to sleep. Judy later became addicted to these pills, and that was only compounded by the fact that your body would build up a tolerance to them, meaning that you would need to take more and more to reach the same effect. Judy and all of her co-stars were put on these strict regimens and given drugs, but Judy seemed to be affected by the drugs more than her co-stars, and she sadly tried committing suicide a few times. As time went on, the studio found it to be too expensive to keep Judy around, and pay for her hospital stays and brief recoveries. Not to mention that she was always late for shoots and had to leave early because of her sickness. They recast her in multiple movies, again costing the studio money, and after 15 years with MGM, she was kicked out for good. In the 50s, she tried making a comeback with Warner Brothers, but was snubbed for Best Actress in 1955, where she lost to Grace Kelly in The Country Girl. For the rest of her career, she appeared on stage and TV and looked, well, kind of scary. After years of using drugs and having untreated depression and mental health issues, it's clear that Hollywood took its toll on Judy. Towards the end of her life, she didn't have much money. And in fact, Fields and Beg Elm, her agents, embezzled around $500,000 from her and she was forced to sell her home. She was staying at friends' houses and apartments to just get by. And on her 47th birthday, she was found dead in her apartment due to a drug overdose. Most people only remember Garland for being in The Wizard of Oz, but her career was so much longer than that, with ups and downs, but for the most part she was just surrounded by people who didn't really care about her or only saw her as a way to make money or to assault. Garland's story is just another sad and tragic yet true tale of child abuse in Hollywood and how people who are managing these kids, the adults managing these kids, don't really care about them after they no longer become viable and are always ready to move on to the next big thing. Sick of trying. I'm tired of living. But scared of dying. So part two, the normalization of abuse in Hollywood. I could go on and on about more women who were child stars and made to hate themselves as adults because of this unfair system that chewed them up and spit them out. Marilyn Monroe comes to mind as she posed nude for a photographer when she was 23 and desperate for money before she became a huge star, only to have her photos later co-opted by Hugh Hefner 
and used to make him rich. She died tragically young and was never really seen as a person to be taken seriously, but rather this idea of a woman that never truly was, even though she did start her own production studio. Carrie Fisher also comes to mind as she was only 19 years old in A New Hope and also introduced to the world of drugs, extremely young, and then of course when angled into a bikini in Return of the Jedi. Raven Simone, of course, was constantly teased for her weight when she was a teenager, only to lose it later as an adult and also be mocked for losing the weight. There's also Selena Gomez, whose mom was only in her late teens at the time when she was driving Selena around for auditions when she was only a kid herself. Demi Lovato was also brought into the entertainment industry extremely young, and she kind of faces the same stigmatization that Garland faced of needing to glam up and being the bigger girl, and she also struggles with substance abuse and mental illness. Even Beyonce started her entertainment career when she was only eight years old, and her parents risked everything to make her and her sister's careers happen. Thankfully, everything seemed to have worked out there, but that's a lot of risk and pressure these parents take on and also put on their children. And again, I'm glad that most of these people are now living their best lives, but it's not easy and a lot of them aren't afraid to share that. I think nowadays as young people like Billie Eilish and Chloe and Halle use social media to express themselves and also since all of this knowledge of how abused child stars are is out there, it helps to mitigate maybe the more pernicious aspects of fame that back in Temple and Garland's days were just whispered through the grapevine. But of course, social media brings on new pressures that are just as hard to deal with. I don't know, I think I'm just trying to be optimistic here. Let me know what you think about social media down in the comments below. Anyway, up until recently, this kind of abuse was just seen as something that you have to deal with if you want to be a star. Like, if you want this job, you better be prepared to do anything. Like, how many old jokes can you find about Harvey Weinstein being a rapist and everyone just shrugging their shoulders and being like, well, that's life, what are you gonna do about it? And some people who refuse to play Weinstein's game of cat and mouse, like Salma Hayek, who was harassed by Weinstein but refused to play his game, were punished for it. Her film, Frida, which was produced by Weinstein's indie production studio Miramax, lost and she didn't win Best Actress Oscar when she only worked with Weinstein to begin with because she knew of his aggressive four-year consideration campaigns, but he didn't campaign for her because she didn't play his game. Recently, as debates about America's Next Top Model have resurfaced, we can see how this idea that you need to be able to bear it all and do anything because if you don't, someone else will, has been detrimental to how we see the entertainment industry. It's normalized this idea that if you want to be on top, you better have some thick skin. We glorify celebrities that can take the heat and that can come out better people on the other side, like Temple and other poised celebrities, but we can't ignore the fact that most people if not everyone, doesn't come out of it without scars. And even those who seemingly can shouldn't be juxtaposed to the people who can't, who can handle the abuse and who have public mental breakdowns. So part three, free Britney. Now of course we get to the main personality of this video and that is of course Britney Spears. Spears is just one in a long line of women who have had to endure patriarchal abuse and also general child abuse at the hands of the entertainment industry. Starting her pop career at age 15 and garnering international fame at age 17 with her Baby One More Time album and with her very revealing Rolling Stone cover, Britney was ubiquitous with sex before she turned 18. And that's honestly so disturbing to say, but that's how she was marketed because that's what people knew would make them money. Her mother, of course, in her tell-all book said that she had no idea about the fact that these people were sexualizing her child or that the Rolling Stone cover was going to look like that. And it's like, yeah, come on, Lynn. A lot of blame is put on the mother in these situations, and it is true that Lynn put Britney in child pageants and talent shows to make money because that's what people do when they're in a financially compromising situation, and that sucks. But dodging the blame isn't the answer. Jamie, Britney's father, however, should also be blamed and is at fault, as he's also the one that has the conservatorship over her now. 
In 2007, after her episode, when Britney was just 26, by the way, just one year older than I am now, she was put under the conservatorship of her father, and the Free Britney movement was born sometime after that. Jamie Lynn Spears, Britney's sister, thinks that the Free Britney people are conspiracy theorists, and actually a lot of the news reports the story that way. And they also say that Britney is fine, and she does seem to be fine. She goes on vacation, she posts her own stuff, etc. She also does see her kids with supervised visits and has custody over them 30% of the time. Though the Free Britney people do seem odd to some, I do think that the Free Britney movement is more than just about freeing Britney. It's a way to say that we don't want to see another tragedy, as so many tales of young women in Hollywood end in death. And the fact that Britney has been battling her father over his conservatorship for some time does prove that she wants to be free in some sense. No one's saying that we think that her dad is drugging her and shoving her in the basement. All we want is for her to have control over her own finances and her own life. When I was a kid growing up, parents around me hated Britney Spears. They hated how she seemingly sexualized herself and how she seemingly forced other girls to do the same. They hated the parents who let their kids dress up as her for Halloween and expose their midriffs, for example. And I do think that anger is warranted, but not at Britney or the other girls, but rather at the patriarchal entertainment industry as a whole, who profit off of young girls' adolescent bodies and talent to make money for themselves and to make themselves rich, only to dispose of these young girls later without so much as a thank you. The love surrounding Britney is great to see. I'm so glad that people are bringing awareness to this cause and that, you know, we're finally starting to like self-reflect on the fact that we turned our backs on this young woman who clearly needed help at the time. We turned our backs on her when she was being hunted down by the paparazzi, when she was being hypersexualized, when she was just in high school. And we said that she just can't take the heat, so she should get out of the kitchen. We made fun of her meltdown and her shaving her head, and even the people online who were trying to, like, support her. You know, this woman seriously needed help, and we just sat back and laughed. So, the conclusion. From the videos and posts that Brittany makes online, it does seem that she's getting the help that she needs and that she's happy. And honestly, that's all I want for her. We've seen stars die tragically too many times to continue to normalize these sad endings as inevitable. What I think would really change the entertainment industry is having real consequences for abuses of power. And not letting one person control the fate of someone else's career. And of course, investing in mental health services for celebrities, young and old alike. I'm glad that we've all been able to learn from this horrible pattern of a centuries-old tale of abuse, and I hope that Britney eventually does get her happy ending. What do you think of Free Britney? Do you support them? Do you think they're conspiracy theorists? Let me know in the comments down below. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Um, my next video is going to be about the women of the Big Bang Theory, so if you want to see that, please subscribe and ring the bell so you're notified every time I post a new video. And if you like this video, please give it a like, leave a comment, share it with someone, and of course, please subscribe and ring the bell. Thank you so much. I'm almost at 1,000 subscribers, and it's really exciting. So again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you to my subscribers and to my patrons, and I'll see you all in the next one.